Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the webinar. Um, thank you all for joining us right now. I am Janie Butler. I'm over here at Beyond Benign with Kate Anderson. We are hosting this webinar. We're also joined with three teachers from New York and Idaho who are doing green chemistry at their different schools. And we're going to be the five of us hosting this webinar. Yeah, so from novice to confident is our is our mantra here for um, novice to confident green chemistry educator and lessons learned. So I'm going to turn it over. We're gonna, Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to move off of slide one. Sorry about that. Awesome. So, like I said, we're here at Beyond Benign hosting this webinar, and so it helps a little bit to know the story of Beyond Benign. Hopefully, you guys have heard of us before, we've met you in different ways, but Beyond Benign is a nonprofit founded in 2007 over here in Wilmington, Mass., right outside of Boston, and our mission is really to spread the education of green chemistry to have ways to make classrooms more sustainable. And our hope is doing this by working through teachers and working through education in ways of having the next generation of learners become greener in the ways that they're practicing. The way we do this is in three different ways. So we do it through curriculum and training, which is hopefully where we've met a bunch of you guys by working at different teacher trainings and workshops. We have a group of lead teachers, which we'll talk about more later. But these are teachers that work with us a lot, one-on-one -on, -one on making different educational resources that can be put directly into the classroom. We do this also by sharing all of our resources online, and we use online courses to also share this information. We also have two different sects, which are in the community engagement, reaching out to people who are around us here in the Boston area, and also with working with universities and colleges of having our green chemistry commitment signers and schools that commit to teaching green chemistry to their students and focus on doing things in a more sustainable way. Fabulous. Thanks, Janie. Um, so if you will, and we're noticing that we've got quite a few people that we're actually that we're, we're friends, uh, friends of Beyond Benign. So thanks so much for tuning in. Um, and this webinar will be recorded. Um, so we did want to let you know that that this webinar will be recorded and will be shared posted on our website um, after today. So for other folks who weren't able to tune in, it will be able to be a resource that has um, is able to be shared with others. Now, um, as you can see, we've got four different roads here leading. Um, and the idea is we want you to take a minute and think about where you would, if you were to describe, you know, where you are in your understanding of green chemistry, would one of these roads help to tell that story for you? So just take a minute.
So I was envisioning sharing a poll with you to get a to get a sense from the audience of of how you'd best describe yourself. I do think that based on based on attendees, based on who we're seeing chiming in for this particular webinar, many of you have come to workshops in the past with us, and that was the goal of, of the workshop of our webinar today. So we appreciate that. So we're gonna do a very quick, whoops, sorry about that. There we go, we're gonna move to the next slide here. It seems to be frozen. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> I have a bit of a technical difficulty here. Uh -huh. Great. Okay. Why is it frozen? All right. Let's see. We're if I can share my screen. Yeah, we're trying. We're trying to. <laughs> we're trying to troubleshoot here to see what exactly happened. Um, because we're basically trying to tell you just a little bit about, you know, what is green chemistry? Do the very, very short, short uh, summary. Um, Scott, I'm going to ask you to just chime in for a second. Can you see? Can you see the screen or are we still stuck on the roads? I'm still looking at the roads. <laughs> OK. We may need to transfer over and share share screens since uh, for whatever reason mine has gotten frozen here. So technical difficulties, bear with us as we navigate screen share here. Hello everyone. <laughs> Welcome to your new screen. Sorry about that. Best laid plans, right? <laughs> okay. Um, again, most of you are really familiar, so me trying to do that poll apparently <laughs> froze things up, even though it didn't do it before. So um, most of you are really familiar with what is green chemistry, so we'll walk through this very, um, you know, very quickly. And again, just a just a refresher: it's the design of chemical products and processes that reduce or and or eliminate the use of hazardous substances. And again, you know, we like to use the phrase "benign by design" or think about it as the science of solutions. Um, as, as we know, the sweet spot for thinking about our green chemistry criteria is finding it right in the middle of cost, safety, and performance because our green chemistry technologies have to have all three criteria in order to be considered successful, um, not just in the lab, but in the marketplace. So this has huge appeal, especially when working with students, because we want to bring in that real world context. And this is a lot of how green chemistry helps us to do that um, and connect with our state and NGS standards, which we'll talk a lot more about um, as we have Sharon, Scott, and Jim share, share their stories of what they're integrating. Now, the 12 principles of green chemistry, obviously we've got a lot of rooted um, foundations as we're connected with John here at the Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry. And the 12 principles act as that, that lens, that guide, that support um, to the tools essentially for, for chemists in the lab designing and thinking about pollution prevention at that very beginning stage and best designing green chemistry technologies. So we wanted to just spotlight a couple of the, the, the new um, technologies out there that could definitely be used and hopefully be seen as possible case studies for integrating it and connecting it with your students. Um, but if you hadn't heard already, Lego is going green. And this is really exciting because it speaks to the mainstreaming of where green chemistry um, you know, is, is headed. And, and that's obviously very excited, exciting for us here. And hopefully that will help again with your students of thinking about how it connects back to something very tangible um, in, in their own world. So 
as as it is always a process, um, you know, the biggest first step for Lego will be to be thinking about how to be using, you know, some of these bioplastics for for some of these smaller things. So those green, you know, the, the things that you see in the, in the picture there, the, those mm -hmm. little pieces of 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 the bigger Lego Lego land puzzle. But it'll it'll be really interesting to see as this again continues to to play out in the marketplace there is just such a demand for bioplastics at the moment that are re reaching those criteria you know and making sure that their performance withstands um, that of traditional fossil fuel based polymers now this is something that again for a lot of and i see both um in terms of audience members we've got College colleges represented in addition to K-12 audience. So thanks so much for tuning in. Um, and this particular one is definitely more geared for undergraduate level. And the Safer Chemical Design game, both Jamie and I took a little time kind of going through the levels uh, a little bit earlier today. And we will say that, um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna vote for undergrad level. It's a little um, tricky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but essentially, so you're put in the role of having to redesign a formulation um, and they, you know, sort of for level one, we were taken through the steps of if you have a cleaner mm -hmm. um, and looking at looking at the solvents and looking looking at those materials and and then um, having to sort of rate and understand what the hazards are associated with that and then having to go back and reformulate. So do you want to add anything to that, Jamie? Sure. Yeah, it is a really neat game. It's really great about talking of all the different properties and qualities that are found within making a detergent and really having to focus on each of those specifically. And then at the end, you also go through looking at its performance and making sure it's able to one, be benign, be made in green chemistry practices, but also be able to perform and do its function. So it's a really great way of tackling some of the harder to imagine things in green chemistry um, that are a little bit more complex and having it really well depicted. Awesome, thanks. So, um, so as we were thinking about putting together this webinar, you know, the target was to reach back out uh, to many of the people who had come to workshops since last spring, and we wanted to just get a gauge and see where people were at in terms of implementation. So several people did fill out our survey, and we really appreciate that. Many of them actually were reflecting on having more higher education related. Um, resources and sort of, again, that higher level. So we did want to give a big shout out to the work that's being done at the higher education level. And at this point, we're over the 50 number for green chemistry commitment signers. And this is very exciting. Sorry, I'm wanting to do it on my screen. Um, this is very exciting. And so, again, thinking, thinking of how as Beyond Benign, you know, we've got our separate programs, but really the goal is to be moving green chemistry education forward as, on the whole and seeing the entire spectrum from early education yeah. all the way through to, to that workforce development piece. All right, so that's not behaving either, even though it did in trial runs. We love this. We love it. Technology. Maybe you'll get to see it later. Technology is fabulous. <laughs> well, again, we will share this resource, and you can also you can check out the Google Map um, site from from here. So the the link is the link is there, and it's clear. Um, okay. So. As we had mentioned, addressing you know what it is that you guys were looking for are more of those qualitative labs. So we wanted to share with you those specifically two higher education resources, and one of which comes out of the partnership with Millipore Sigma and My Green Lab. So this is a terrific guide um, with a whole set of green chemistry experiments for the undergrad um, organic lab. Now this is again higher level so it goes to some of the background but there are some really useful resources at the k-12 level and especially if you're thinking about some of your ap students then this um, could be a really good resource for you the other 
the other um, resource that we've had was developed back, um, it was a few years ago now, but it was in partnership with EPA. And, and this is a case study on several of the most common Gen Chem labs out there. So, and this was in partnership with many of our, our faculty um, partners connected through the Green Chemistry Commitment. And you can go and click on this for more resources related specifically to Beer's Law, Hess's Law, qualitative analysis. Again, I can go through, but, but there's six labs there that um, are also going to be useful for that for those higher level and for more of that qualitative um, level labs that people are looking for. So yeah, thanks. Okay, that's working now. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Uh, so we did want to mention that we have a fun new update to one of our more popular tried and true labs that likely if you've come to one of our workshops you have seen um, because it is definitely one of the more in demand. Um, so one of our green chemistry replacements for the Le Chatelier's Equilibrium Lab traditionally uses black tea. But thanks to a tip from one of our teachers down in Texas, she highly recommended using butterfly tea in this reaction um, and Jamie actually got a nice little snapshot for us here um, where you can see that the color change is just that much more vivid and um, clear for, for students when using and looking at the acid base um, controls with the blue tea. So yeah. In terms of timing right now, reflecting with our, our team, who's going to be jumping in and sharing their stories here in just a second. Um, but so across the country, obviously, we're teaching, you know, sometimes our pacing is a little bit a little bit different. Um, but we were hearing that several teachers, especially um, in New York, you may it may be timing wise for you to be start thinking about acid base labs. So we wanted to let you know about the acid-based labs that we have on, um, on the Beyond Benign website, one of which a, a relatively new modification was to our fabulous fabric. So this was a natural dye lab that focuses on um, thinking about the cogent technology from out of steel case where they are no longer using antimony in their dyeing process of polyester fabric. So this has been adopted um, and for this particular lab, you now you can actually find leveled labs for both middle school and for the high school related to using Kool-Aid as your, you know, basically your standardized dye, which is the standardized dye for looking at um, stain, stain resistance in... In industry. Sorry, in industry, yeah. yes. Um, so, so, so we have that linked here for you if acid-based uh, chemistry is coming up next. Um, as you're coming out of the gate, then this that could be a really useful thing. And we also added on here the video because this was another resource that you guys are asking for more of which we hear we hear you loud and clear and we're going to be working on putting together some more short videos to be sharing up on our website and making sure that that gets out to our our teachers because we know that's what you're looking for you're looking for those short little videos that can help synthesize you know the particular replacement lab and then get that out there so that you can see it um in real time so yeah Great. So let's hand it off to our teachers to hear a little bit about what's happening in the classroom. So let's start with you, Jim. Hey, everybody. Hoping you can hear me. It looks like it. Um, yeah, it sounds so great. I am taking, okay, I'm taking the responsibility of being the novice in this novice to confident educator webinar. Um, I I'm in my fifth year teaching chemistry, uh, but my first year really incorporating green chemistry on, on the student side of, of things. I had started my career, uh, if we can go to the next slide, 
in uh, Buffalo and I, I started in uh, December. So I had to really fly through a year of chemistry going from December to June. And so I, I found myself going pretty much by the seat of my pants and finding whatever I could online or from other teachers and just going with it. So I found myself using uh, the, the chromate, dichromate, Le Chatelier's lab, except I had it in full on beakers instead of uh, micro scale. So I had these uh, huge amounts of, of carcinogens going on in, in my lab and just without the time to be able to think about it. And uh, so a, a couple of years later, three years ago, I, I got a, the job I have now in very northern New York where uh, when I was first looking through my, my stock room, I uh, came across uh, with my superintendent uh, there in the summer, a few gallons of concentrated nitric acid sitting in the organic flammables cabinet, which is not a great combination. I might have let out a couple four-letter words there by accident in front of him. And I, I kind of guessed the teacher's probably using it for the Ira Remsen copper nitric acid demo, but I, I didn't really see a need for gallons of it. And so having the time to think about it and, and seeing what I had um, what I had in taking over for some retiring teachers, I started really making it uh, an emphasis in my labs to microscale a lot of what I could. Uh, I started buying only uh, what I needed until it would go bad uh, so that I didn't have these expired chemicals going bad in my stock room and not really having the, the money to dispose of them. And so doing these kind of things on, on my own, trying to save stuff, trying to make it safer. Um, I, I was talking with a local professor last spring and he, he said, oh, you know, there's, there's a word for this. It's green chemistry. And he told me to go look it up and find some things. And, and so I did. And so over the, that summer, uh, this past summer, if we can go to the next slide, what I did, I, I probably pretty immediately signed up for the introduction to green chemistry class. Uh, if you're listening and haven't taken it, I really suggest that it, re it got me uh, really looking at my materials and, and making an emphasis to uh, green them up and looking at the 12 principles and everything just kind of made sense. I was really glad there was actually a, a community for doing this and uh, materials out there. And so part of my summer plans were, go, were to go to the uh, biennial conference on chemical education. And uh, the picture of that plane there is the plane I took to get to, um, oh, to not that, but to, to Boston. Um, so I went to these uh, conferences. I found uh, workshops from Beyond Benign. And uh, the picture on the right there, uh, if, if you've been to a workshop, you might see it. There actually was a purpose for clipping all those uh, butterfly clips on the, the post-it there. But, started really working with the with Beyond Benign's uh, activities and kind of planning what I was going to be doing for the the next school year including using hashtags in a lot of uh, any way I could to annoy my students because I learned Twitter is really fun over the summer. So this year is my first year going through um, using green chemistry outwardly towards the students. Um, a lot of what I had done just kind of on my own and over the summer was just editing labs, changing up labs. Uh, this was the first year <clears throat> that I had, had presented it in any way to my students. So I gave them the 12 principles. I said, uh, I told them to research and present on a, on a disaster in the chemical industry, as well as uh, what we learned from it and, and present to the class uh, a green chemistry educate, uh, uh, invention and how does that apply to the, uh, the 12 principles. Uh, can we go back a slide? Sorry. I had them uh, also look at labs that they had already done in order to think about what they could have changed to it to make it uh, a bit more green and, and fit the 12 principles. Uh, there were a few kinds of students who would do that. They, they there were some that made some memes and suggested some changes, uh, which weren't really okay changes like changing sodium nitrate for potassium nitrate in the solubility curve lab and not realizing that the picture he used of, uh, of sodium nitrate has just as many warning labels on it and is arguably in some ways worse than 
uh, potassium nitrate. And then there were others that for the same kind of thing, they, they really looked through the safety data sheets and, and suggested changes to make them inherently more safer or uh, less toxic. So that's been so far this year. It's been while well, I've just my goal was just to kind of see how the students would would pick up on uh, actually learning it as an actual uh, part of the year. So if we can now go to the last slide there, what I want to do in the the near and distant future is use labs with them since they they really seem to enjoy it and like the environmental spin on on chemistry. That I, I want to do more labs that are specifically in their face green chemistry labs, like um, using the T lab for Le Chatelet's principle, uh, using color flame candles instead of um, solutions for the flame test, and not just doing it, but having them also look at doing the lab in a green chemistry way. Um, I want to, as well, th this year is my first year using the chemistry modeling curriculum. I want to figure out, uh, now that they've seen the principles and used it a bit, uh, how I can incorporate green chemistry into the, the modeling curriculum and whether it's worth doing lessons just for it or trying to incorporate it into other parts of the year. Uh, I'm also in the process of working with uh, that same local professor on uh, doing some modifications to the copper cycling lab, which I'm sure a lot of us out here do, uh, trying to cut down on the waste a bit and trying to make it a little bit easier to fit into uh, a 40 minute period. And since uh, my students really picked up on it, I do want to use more of Beyond Benign's uh, activities that, that they have on, on the website and really incorporate it rather than just doing things behind the scenes to make things more safer. I want to really incorporate it into the class. I was just kind of playing around and seeing how well they'd, uh, they'd, they'd take to green chemistry. Part of that I'd like to uh, eventually have uh, each year do a kind of road salt project uh, and incorporate data collection and, and um, looking at the effects of road salt in different units throughout the year. Um, since I'm in an area where road salt is used probably three quarters of the year, it's, uh, it's very relevant to them. It'd be nice to be able to incorporate something year long uh, to, to really anchor the green chem into, into everything. So that's where I've been and what I've done this year. If anyone has uh, questions or stuff to share, um, you can find my email somewhere in here or, or my Twitter. And uh, I think I'm going to be able to pass it over to Sharon now. Great. Thank you so much, Jim. And sorry for following you up on the slides a little bit there, but it was really great for you to share your story. And yeah, thank you so much. So. Sharon, if you would like to share a bit of your story. Hi, I'm Sharon and I'm the old lady in this group. Um, we just, I, I decided I wanted to use this picture because this is my hobby. I am involved in a group that recreates the Middle Ages and at that point I was queen and it was a pretty cool thing. And it's the best picture that I think I have of myself. So as I said, I'm the old lady in this group. I started working in chemistry labs in the late 80s and was a professional scientist until I retired 15 years ago and started becoming a teacher. And one of the jobs that I had was in Maryland where the um, water quality issues were, were big. And our facility, we did research and development and there was a lot of stuff that we worked with that we really had to be very conscious of what we did with. And the water that left our building really had to be cleaner than the water that came in. We had to be completely conscious in planning and ordering and disposing of everything. So I sort of came to this, to, to education with preconceived notions of what I should and shouldn't do. Then I got here and just like Jim, my cabinets were full of crazy things and I was looking at them and saying, there's no way I would have ordered this when I was a professional scientist, what's it doing in a high school lab? And spent a fair bit of time just trying to get things cleaned up. One of the things that 
I'm focusing on because now I'm I'm I've been teaching for 13 years and I've been working really hard lately to make myself more attuned to the standards. Idaho just passed new standards that are NGSS-esque and so we're in the middle of completely redoing our whole curriculum. This year we did the solids lab and so we've just finished bonding and the standard is plan and conduct an investigation to gather evidence to compare the structure of substances at the bulk scale to infer the strength of electrical forces between particles. So traditionally, you might use something like naphthalene or polyvinyl alcohol or some of these other chemicals that I actually have in my back room. But I wanted to think about it in terms of what was going to be safer for my students, what wasn't going to stink up the lab, and what could I just easily get that I could do molecular and they could see molecular bonding easily. With this particular um, performance expectation in the evidence statement, it really focuses on change of state and not solubility. In the past, one of the things that's been sort of a hang up with this lab, especially with the molecular substances, was you had to have some sort of a nasty polar solvent to show that, say, your naphthalene would dissolve in benzene, but it wouldn't dissolve in water. And there's just, it's just so fraught. Um, you wound up with complex waste that was ionic substances with hexanes or benzene, and it, it was a mess to dispose of. Um, mixed waste is always a problem. So I totally redid it so that we weren't dealing so much with solubility and we really focused more on uh, melting point because that's really what this particular standard is going after, which meant I got to get rid of all the nasty solvents. I still did, did, did do a little bit of a solubility with that, but mostly looking at conductivity. So we just used water as our solvent and if it didn't dissolve in water, it didn't dissolve in water, but it was paraffin. So I can just throw that away and I didn't have to worry about the waste stream that I was creating. So if the, could you do the next slide please? So challenges. The first challenge that I found was reducing volume sometimes reduces understanding because if you see at the bottom of the screen, there's this slide with these lovely little dots and it is a double replacement lab where they're trying to figure out what it, trying to come up with solubility rules. But they didn't really understand by looking at their results that they were seeing a solid being formed. So I didn't want to put this whole lab back up into test tube size because even at two or three mils, that's just a lot of uh, material. So I do one precipitation and we watch it and we see how it gets cloudy and then we see how it settles. So at the top there you see what's still really only two or three milliliters, but they see that the reaction happens and a solid is formed and it, and it settles out and they have that understanding of what's going on that they didn't get from just doing the drop experiment. For the drop experiment, we can do all kinds of combinations. This is just one example. And they get to see when a solid is formed, when it's not. But the entire lab for all of my students takes between 25 and 50 milliliters of solution. And even with that, I have leftovers. So I wind up reducing volume a lot for the entire lab without reducing understanding by doing a demo in the beginning. One of the things that I totally didn't expect was it was harder for the school to reimburse me for things I buy at the grocery store. If I buy it from Flynn, yay, they'll, re they'll reimburse me for anything I buy from Flynn, including a bag of sugar. But if I buy it at my local store, they want to know why I'm buying food at the store and bringing it into a chemistry classroom. So that's taken some explaining and there's still some times where I just suck it up and pay for the materials that I want at the grocery store because they're not, the school isn't going to reimburse me for Cheetos. Um, even though Cheetos are really the best thing to do for some of the calorimetry labs. One of my uh, 
soap boxes is universal indicator. That stuff is evil. Uh, if you look at the hazard warnings on universal indicator, it has three or four different carcinogens in it. And I looked at that and I was like, I don't want my kids anywhere near this. Kids don't like the smell of cabbage juice, but I don't like the carcinogenity of universal indicator. And cabbage juice is a great universal indicator. Uh, along those lines, for the Le Chatelier lab, I use blueberry juice because I get an even better color change than with any of the teas I've ever tried, because blueberry juice is also a very good pH indicator. So I've gone to using a lot of the natural pH indicators. Sometimes we use turmeric, um, red onion skins. There's a lot of, of things you can buy at the grocery store and wouldn't mind eating for dinner alternatives to pH indicators that you can buy from Flynn. But the biggest challenge for me, um, especially coming from a not education background, and in, this is so deep I didn't even ever student teach, was rethinking what I'm doing, reassessing my assumptions, and looking at the lab manuals that I was given and saying, huh, I don't like this, and trying to figure out a better way. So that is always a challenge. Re reassessing assumptions is an important skill, I think, and I still do it every day in trying to make sure that I'm doing what's best for my kids in all the different ways. So if we could get the next slide, please. One of my success stories is in my AP Chemistry class, we do this inquiry-based chromatography, which is investigation number five in the AP Chemistry lab book. But I expanded it because it, in the AP Chemistry example, they only give you like three or four or five solvents. And in the world, there are a lot of solvents to choose from. So I also give them an article from Green Chemistry that Galaxo Smith Klein put out about solvent selection and their solvent guide. And so it's a pretty dense piece of reading, but I have my kids read that as part of their pre-lab, and then I allow them to choose from these 14 solvents that I have. And I have some things back there that are, are not particularly good for anyone, and they, if they use them, they have to do it in the hood and that kind of thing. But my students are awesome about really only choosing the green solvents. And I manage, they manage to see the differences between polar and nonpolar, and I wind up with one-tenth the organic waste compared to what I had before. So I really think that this is an awesome way of getting the kids to decide for themselves. You, you have an inquiry lab where they're picking what solvents they want to use to separate the food dyes. They're looking at structures. They're doing all of the hard thinking work. Um, and they're choosing to do it in a safer way. So that is my presentation. It's apparently time for Scott. Good afternoon, green chemistry people. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey Scott. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we want to jump in real quick. Um, just because both Jim and Sharon were both recent um, participants. Yeah, <laughs> participants of the online course, we wanted to just take a quick minute for a tiny little plug for the intro to green chemistry online course, which will be taught um, again this summer. And there is an opportunity to go ahead and register online. So just wanted to take that nod and thank you, Jim. Jim and Sharon for sharing your experiences of what it's been like, um, you know, in terms of implementing it after taking the online course. So now we're going to turn it over to Scott. Take two. Good <laughs> afternoon, <laughs> green chemistry people. So it's wonderful to actually get a chance to talk to people who are interested in implementing green chemistry. Um, my name is Scott Carlson. I work for MH Maxwell High School in Brooklyn, New York. I've been teaching chemistry for 13 years, actually as well and in about 2015 i got a chance to meet some amazing people who were doing absolutely phenomenal work on revising laboratories and making the world a safer place for students taking chemistry at that time and opportunity i was in the beginning of my career having to have the privilege of having this phenomenal lab technician come in he would come in it was like batman he came in the night prepped my labs and left in the morning this phenomenal creature made it so that I was able to walk into my laboratory, print out my lab reports, hand it to the students, teach my lesson, and they were able to go and run with it. Then I changed locations. 
And now I find myself as one of the only chemistry teachers responsible for ordering, prepping, writing, lesson planning, and maintaining safety constraints in the laboratory for an, either an entire department of one. In doing that, I, want to, I started the search for finding the most safe, economical, and sustainable ways of implementing chemistry laboratories that allowed my kids to get the wow factor, but also allowed them to see their connectivity to it in their real world. And I was most fortunate to attend this training, the trainer workshop up in SUNY in 2015. The first things I did was I ran back home and tried the color flame lab and the assets and bases labs. There's a reason why I did that. That same year in New York City, I don't know how many of you are from New York, but in New York City, we had an actual accident in early 2015 where a young lady was doing a laboratory for the rainbow lab where she was lighting the actual compounds on fire. Most of us have done labs like that in the past to varying levels of success and wow factor. This particular incident, however, didn't exactly work in her favor. And the, there was a student injured, there were, she was injured, and she didn't come out very well at the end of the whole experience. That same year, about after that ordeal occurred, I got a phone call in my classroom, and it was my principal, and he said, hey, Carlson, do not do the rainbow lab. I said, I did it a month ago to no actual consequence. There was no problem with it. But after hearing about that experience, I knew there needed to be a better way to do things. And that's why I fell for the green chemistry commitment and promise regarding actually doing the changing the laboratories in the chemistry curriculum in New York City such that they would be honorable of the 12 principles and allow students to experience things independently. In doing that, next slide if you could. In doing that, I started adapting the labs to the curriculums that are exist in New York City. So we're talking about things like the phenomena uh, movement with NGSS and the changes of the standards. We're talking about, we have in New York City, the Regents exams, which are our uh, gateway graduation requirements. We're talking about trying to make it so that we honor the inquiry process. There is nothing so amazing as giving your students a laboratory setup and they were telling you they want to explode some things and saying, sure, you could if you can figure out how to do it. And you can give them an almost entirely independent project in the laboratory that will be safe for them to do and safe for them to explore and safe for them to see the outcome and then they can pour it down the sink. And that's some of the things we did with in my classroom this year where we did Le Chatelier's principle with the black tea. I didn't know about the bubble tea, PT, but that also goes to show how innovation evolves every time we go back and re-examine what it is we did in the past. And the kids can do these labs with things they see at home. Aside from the powerful impact of having a student be able to own their own learning, experiencing this without a cookbook lab, without me holding their hand and directing them, now pour the test tubes back in they can see what happens because I guarantee you, most of you have seen in the classroom, kids ask, well, what if I don't do it that way? What if I pour it backwards? If you're dealing with dangerous compounds, a lot of times what ends up happening is we have many panic attacks and pray they listen when we say don't do it when our backs are turned. With this, I was able to actually have a lot more trust in my students' level of inquiry, have a lot more faith in their ability to find out for themselves what happens without there being danger of me having to worry about incident reports. With that in mind, real world came into the classroom for them because in green chemistry, one of the main ideas is that all the things on planet Earth are already existing and completing their biochemical processes at room temperature, which means that all the amazing stuff the kids wanna see that they don't believe is happening in their own bodies can be demonstrated in the laboratory with safer materials at room temperature. In doing that, you can also have them, you, I was also able to have them do their labs at home on occasion. A lot of times the simpler labs like the acids and bases lab, they were able to do with a level of actual rigor in their houses with annotation, inquiry, and full write-ups and pictures 
And that's the level of trust I, was, I wasn't able to acquire before I attempted to do green chemistry this way. In that vein, part of what we're doing in New York City is also trying to revise the, and develop a citywide laboratory chemistry manual. And in doing and being part of that process, part of what I'm able to do is make adv advisements regarding the green chemistry curriculum and having a chance to see it come to fruition around New York City with a lot of teachers being requested to utilize these green chemistry laboratories across the city. Some of the times I see this happening, we have challenges. And one of the biggest challenges the students come to me with is, well, when are we going to actually see something burn? When are we going to actually see something explode? When are we going to actually see something that could do some damage to you? And that's the biggest complaint I get when I'm doing green chemistry labs. And that's all I do at this point. I can't think of the last time I did a lab that involved something that I couldn't trust to throw in the trash can and have a regular custodian pick up. The explosions and the dynamism that one expects from the chemistry can be achieved if you're willing to look for it. And uh, things like peroxide for elephant toothpaste, things like using nu in nuclear chemistry with just basic toys. There are a lot of different things that I was able to do adopting this philosophy that I wouldn't have been able to even approach or think about as an option beforehand. So with that in mind, the green chemistry laboratory replacements met the challenges of my students. I was able to get to reach, and that's what the picture actually is, I was get to reach, able to reach a number of educators in New York City regarding these principles. And the literature also supports the fact that they're able to actually approach these with their levels of reading being across the gamut. So a student who reads at a second or third grade level can be trusted to try some of these experiments without the danger being apparent. With that in mind, green chemistry has taken over my curriculum, honestly, and I'm very happy to be able to say it did it to its advantage. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Scott. And um, so just sort of to wrap up the this last last 10 minutes about that we have together, um, we want to throw it out there to the audience and feel free to go ahead and enter in your questions if you have any um, very specific ones for for either Jim, Scott, Sharon, or any questions just for Janie and myself. Um, we wanted to additionally put a little nod out there to the lead teacher program, which Scott is one of the members of. So we've got about 20 lead teachers across the country, um, everywhere from Pennsylvania to Idaho to Minnesota, all over, and we're looking to expand. So if you are someone who is doing green chemistry in your classroom, and you have some of the lessons that have just been shared by Jim, Scott, and Sharon, then we want to hear from you. And we would love for you to apply to be a part of the program. And the deadline is February 28th, so there's still time. But feel free to go ahead and check out the website for more information about the program. And you can always send us an email with any of your questions as well. So with that, I'm gonna start the ball rolling. We do have one question here, and either Jim, Scott, or Sharon, one of you guys, if you can go ahead and just chime in if you think you would like to share an answer to this, but what pushback, if any, have you experienced from school administrators or other teachers that you work with? Well, for one, most of the teachers that I work with are, want to really fight for the explosive labs. They're as adamant about as, as about doing the old school labs as the students are about seeing something that's potentially dangerous. And when that is their pushback, I always ask them, I said, what is the trade-off you're getting for those experiences? And what is the goal in your, in your pedagogy? Are you trying to teach them this specific thing that they'd only be able to experience if they grew up and became a chemist? Or are you trying to expand chemical literacy across the curriculum and make the students able to see that this is what's going on in their gut? This is what's going on underground. 
This is what's going on around them. And this is what's things that you do when you cook and you see things in your kitchen. If a, a child can connect the real world to what they see in the chemistry classroom, suddenly the chemistry classroom becomes less alien. And it becomes a lot easier to do that when the things, when the items in the chemistry classroom laboratory aren't foreign chemicals. So I pose the same question to teachers. If they can do it, and we can do it in planet Earth without the harmful solvents, why can't you? And this is Sharon. I just want to add, a lot of it's just inertia. Uh, when I talk to other teachers, they're like, well, we've always done it this way. What's wrong with how we've always done it? And they're comfortable. They don't want to change what they're doing, even if it is a safety issue. So a lot of that is, part of it's just education, and part of it's cajoling them into doing something that's safer. They all think I'm crazy that I don't want to use a universal indicator. They think it's the greatest stuff ever, even after I make them read the side of the bottle. So, and then as I mentioned before, getting the administration to reimburse me for things that I buy at the grocery store. The Cheeto lab is one of my favorite labs, but I will never get them to reimburse me for a bag of Cheetos. Thanks, Sharon and Scott. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we, we appreciate you sharing, you know, what it's been like for you and again, how to sort of navigate those conversations because I think a lot of times people can, they're going to connect and they're going to feel your passion, you know, and especially if you're able to give them some pretty thoughtful information, then the, that's hopefully going to help with some of their, you know, preconceived notions of what, of what the chemistry lab has to, has to continue to look like, even though here we are in 2019 and, you know, real world chemistry is most certainly all about embracing green chemistry principles. Um, uh, I've got another question here, and this one is, and I think you guys have kind of alluded to this, but I'd love for you to maybe elaborate. So how have your students responded to doing green chemistry lessons? And I know, Jim, you spoke to this a little bit, so I don't know if, um, Sharon, maybe you want to share a little bit about if you've noticed a difference with your students changing things up. So, unlike Jim, I haven't been brave enough to actually say, oh, and look, we're doing green chemistry now. My kids love the fact that we did in AP chemistry a very complex look at intermolecular forces with chocolate and chocolate breaking. Um, I have a student in here right now nodding. It was, they had fun with that and it was yummy. And it really got, they were looking at complex structures and complex interactions and they were getting it, and they were getting it better than they were going to get it with any of the traditional intermolecular forces labs. So one of the things that is on my to-do list is to make it much more obvious that I'm trying to make a safer lab and a safer lab experience. But I think my kids do appreciate that I put their safety first, and they know that I care about safety. So I think that makes them feel safer. Hello, I'm sorry. I'm I feel like I'm there's no sound right now. Hey, I Scott, can hear you sorry. right there, Scott. Hey, Scott, you're there. Sorry, it was me. It was me being muted, and I read off a question to Janie. 
<laughs> only. Um, so we had uh, the local professor that Jim is working with, and he has a small undergrad research group that's working on those green chemistry labs. And his question is, what new experiments would we like to see developed that could really be used in school? Mm. I had a teacher ask me when I tried to pitch green chemistry to her, actually, literally on Monday, I don't know if any of you are in New York City, went to um, Brooklyn North's PD regard at Brooklyn Tech. I was talking about green chemistry the whole time to most of my colleagues. And one of the things that we were talking about was the applications of green chemistry to the higher ed portion. And I was so grateful to see that in the PowerPoint and actually in some of the things that we presented to you today, it was an opportunity for you guys to get a chance to access some of the higher educational labs that would fit into AP chemistry, quantitative analysis, dimens um, what do you call it, the actual higher level chemistry classes that we want our students to take. And so I think a lot of times people want to see more quantitative analysis labs. As of the moment, I also teach AP chemistry and I'm doing the iodine clock lab with uh, vitamin C and that allows me to use the lab pros and get the quantitative analysis data. But I'm sure I would love to see more quantitative things that like, for example, that don't involve the chemicals in order to make the dimensional analysis more accurate and easy to see. Great, and thank you. That was Martin Walker from <laughs> Potsdam. So thanks, thanks so much for that question. And we'll, um, I think that's certainly something that here us here at Beyond Benign are very interested in. And so we're gonna always be continuing to follow up. And this is why we greatly appreciate it when people fill out our follow-up surveys, because that helps us to get the information that we need to get those new labs developed and out there. Um, so I have an additional question, and that is, what labs are you most excited to work with in the next year? So anyone want to chime in on that? What are the what are the labs that you're most excited about to work on for the next year? With our students so or I, work on developing? Yeah, I mean, it could be, how about either? Because <laughs> I think, you know, we can sort of think about it both ways. So every once in a while when, um, when I have students uh, stay after school for help or to, to do a lab or something like that. Um, while they're, while they're working in the classroom part, we'll make, uh, uh afternoon chemist tea and, uh, just get them to relax a little bit and have, have some tea. And, um, so I'd really like to try the, uh, the, the, um, butterfly tea, um, Le Chalier's lab out uh, instead of the, the black tea or, um, the potassium chromate, dichromate. Um, also recently, just this past year, finally got us a pontification lab to um, to work, but I want to see if there's any way to make it a little less um, less harsh as far as the the base required. Yeah, it's so funny you mentioned the saponification lab because that was one of my questions from last year about what lab would I want to see green would be a saponification lab, and there one I don't know Kate, but did we were well, the other um. The other higher ed link to the other green chemistry labs we also have affiliation with. The avocado green soap is a pontification lab. Well, that it exists. This is a laboratory that does avocado soap uh, saponification, and all the materials regarding it are relatively green and sustainable and safe. And that's one of the partner organizations we work with that has access to those laboratories materials as well. All you do is send them an email. And yeah. that's what I'm looking forward to trying today, this year rather. I'm okay. looking forward to trying the saponification lab with avocados. Okay. Awesome. No, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Yep. So um, we're going to we're gonna wrap it up because we've got less than a minute now. So I wanted to just share quickly um, the contact information of all of the presenters today. And a huge, giant thank you to Scott, Jim, and Sharon for taking the time to, to be a part of the webinar with us today. And for all of the participants who turned it turned in, um, tuned in. We really appreciate it. And yeah, so 
hopefully, yep, us, yes, our contact information. You can always contact either Janie or myself. Um, now, please make sure, as Jim had mentioned, to go ahead and follow us on Twitter, hashtag, you know, beyond benign, hashtag green chemistry. And you can sort of continue to see what we're up to in social media. And, and most of you have already signed our, up for our newsletter. But if you haven't already, then please take that opportunity. So thanks so much for tuning in and enjoy the rest of either your afternoon or your evening. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. So thanks so much.